Welcome to Your Strata Property, the podcast for property owners looking for reliable, accurate and bite-sized information from an experienced and authoritative source. To access previous episodes and useful strata tips, go to www.yourstrataproperty.com.au. Hello and welcome to this week's podcast episode. I am your host, Amanda Farmer, and I am the Strata Lawyer helping you to demystify the legal complexities of this crazy world we call apartment living. As we have commenced 2021 with a little more uncertainty, perhaps, than we had hoped, borders closing once again, some of us subject to unexpected lockdowns. I thought it a good time to bring you one of my favourite interviews from the 2020 Shared Space Summit. I'll tell you a little bit more about this particular interview guest in a minute, but in case you missed it, the summit was an online event that I hosted in September last year, the first of its kind in the world, bringing to your computer screens nine world-leading experts on community, property, and law. Well over a 1,000 people registered to attend the Shared Space Summit, making it the largest online gathering of strata property owners the world has ever seen. And yes, Shared Space will be back this year We are already kicking off the planning process for Shared Space 2021. I'll be letting you know later in the year how you can make sure that you'll be involved in Shared Space 2021. One of our most popular guest experts in last year's summit, and as I've said, one of my favourite summit interviewees, was Charles Vogel an executive advisor and regular guest lecturer at Yale School of Management and the Yale Leadership Institute. Charles supports leaders in technology, finance and government to grow more effective in creating change. In his 20s, Charles served in the US Peace Corps in northern Zambia. There, he witnessed inspirational community inside his rural village. After the Peace Corps, Charles founded Broken English Productions in New York City. His PBS projects touch on topics such as education, school reform and civil rights advocacy. His film work won many awards, including the Amnesty International prestigious Movies That Matter Award. He is the author of three books. His first book, the international bestseller, The Art of Community, shares how both community and belonging can be built through time-tested principles and rituals. The book is a guide to creating meaningful communities that enrich both individuals and humanity. It has won a Nautilus Book Award for business and leadership writing. His latest book, Building Brand Communities, speaks specifically to organisation leaders connecting the people important for success. Charles is also an advisor to Google's Global Performance and Health Programs and a member of the Google Vitality Lab, where he collaborates to innovate healing in our era. Now, in this interview, you are about to hear Charles and I talk about how the groundwork of building good relationships in our communities very often needs to happen before there's a crisis. Why it's important to build good communication habits as soon as possible. We talk about how not everyone is going to participate equally in any given community effort. There is going to be in our communities, in our strata communities, radically unequal participation, and that's okay. We talk about how we need to protect those who do participate more so that they will continue to serve. We talk about lots more. There has never been a better time, I think, to revisit this interview If you haven't heard it before, then you are in for a treat, and I hope that it inspires you to take positive action in your communities, even, and especially, during times of crisis. Now, I said that we had nine world-leading experts join us for the Shared Space Summit in 2020. Charles is just one of those experts. All of the summit interviews are inside our members-only video library. And if you are a member of our online community, 
our many members out there, you know who you are, you have access to all of these interviews to watch at any time, as many times as you like as part of your membership. If you're not a member and you'd like access to the kind of experts that I am giving you a little taste of here with this episode today, then you want to join the waitlist for membership and you will be the first to know when I open the doors to new members this year. You can join that waitlist over at yourstrataproperty.com.au slash membership. I will take you over right now to my Shared Space Summit interview with Charles Vogel. Charles Vogel, welcome. I'm delighted to be invited. Pleasure to have you here with us today. I want to start, Charles, with your book here, The Art of Community. I have my copy here, if anyone can see that in the lights. And I was having a look at the uh, endorsements on the back, and I can see here Alan Price, the founding director of the Global Leadership Initiative at Harvard Business School, has said that the book is powerful, practical, and inspiring Emerging or veteran leaders who integrate these principles will build communities that are more resilient, passionate and harmonious in the face of adversity and uncertainty. Now that was written, I think, in 2016. And we are now today seeing communities face the type of uncertainty and adversity that some of us probably couldn't have anticipated. Do you think some communities are better prepared for this, for the current world state, than others? I think that there's a lot of evidence that uh, certain groups of people, depending on how much they trust each other and how much we call foundation of relationship were in place before there was a challenge, are finding ways to get this challenge far better than others. Mm. And in the, in the case of a pandemic, uh, there are very quantifiable measures, not the least of which are infections and deaths. So yes, no question, there are people who are doing better and worse. And fortunately or unfortunately, it's also evidence that for those of us who want to do well in the world in groups, uh, the groundwork of building relationships very often, if not always, needs to happen before there's a crisis. Uh, the time we want to ask for help or ask questions to help us understand how things are spiraling out of control uh, is not when things are spiraling out of control. And mm. that's an investment in bringing people together ahead of time. Um, I would use the term building community, but I'm okay if anybody uses any other term. You mentioned there, Charles, trust. And that's something that I really want to talk about today. In your latest book, Building Brand Communities, you use the term building a trust bank. And that really resonated with me. The people that I help and our viewers today, as you know, are people who live in apartment building strata, we call them. You might call them over there homeowner associations. And I see myself in my day-to-day -day work, those who trust the people who are leading their community, whether that's the committee or the council of owners, just do so much better. They're much better off and, and can achieve more powerful things in their community. What does building a trust bank mean? Well, there are literally whole books on building trust and how trust is lost. And so let's just acknowledge that for anybody who wants to take this seriously, um, it's a much deeper subject we can touch on here. And while I can speak on it, I'm not the expert on this. For the context of stepping forward in a leadership role in community, uh, the way I think about trust in a pragmatic sense is this idea that we have experiences that tell you that I'm competent to do what I say I'm going to do, that I understand what you need and your perspective, and that anything that I do will be consistent with that. And it might be something you don't like. Like I might say, well, everybody's locked up at home during a pandemic. We're going to have a sound curfew at 8 o'clock at night. Please turn mm -hmm. off or turn down your stereo because all of your neighbors are always around every night. You may not like that. Um, if you think I'm looking out for me and just want to uh, be petty, then that conversation is going to go poorly. If we've had experiences where you think, I actually want the elderly, the sick, uh, parents are putting children down for uh, nighttime uh, stories, to have a quiet place to live to do that, uh, you may be more compliant. But in order for you to understand that, it, we will need to have experiences that might be called conversations where you understand I'm not out to get you. Um, I'm trying to create a place where we all have a place where families can uh, successfully rest in the evening. Mm. 
And you've said that conversations and communication is something that we talk about a lot. I talk about it on the podcast. Uh, I talk about it with my clients that if you can um, master that art of communication and communicating effectively, um, you're, you're going to be much better off. And I can see how that then feeds into that idea of building trust, establishing um who you are, what you stand for, why you're doing the job you do. If you're a chairperson, a secretary, uh, a strata manager, I'm not doing this because I just want to uh, rule the roost here. I'm doing this for the benefit of the whole and communicating that. Yeah, the danger that I see is we can tell people that communication is good and that that is true. It is, it is not wrong. Uh, the, the danger I see happens is this belief that communication only needs to be good when it's needed right away. And when we're in community, and I define community in my work as a group of people who sh- um, share mutual concern for one another, i.e. they're not out for individuals and they're not trying to dominate each other. There can be competition involved, but they do care about the welfare of one another. Mm. Uh, that investment of good communication needs to happen before there's a crisis. And if you don't understand that, then you don't invest in it, or you consider it a bother, or you actually stamp it out. And then now if we're going to use a COVID example, right, we're all stuck around each other all the time. And some people want to play stereos at nine o'clock at night and other people are putting kids down for bed. Now we start the communication. That's probably not going to go well. It might go well, but probably not. So if we want to take our role seriously about being a leader, and all I mean by leader is we're creating a future that wouldn't exist without collaboration. We need to invest in that communication really as soon as possible. As soon as we want to connect people we're going to collaborate with in the case of a housing situation living together. Another concept that resonated with me, Charles, from your work was that of the the strong core. And you talk about the strong core together with the Pareto principle. Can you explain that for us? Because I saw that really mapping across to we have a, a core of committee members or a council of owners who are then working with the larger owners corporation or body corporate. Um, what's the strong core all about? All right. Well, so the book you're referring to is my latest book called Building Brand Communities, and in that I'm specifically speaking to organizational leaders who are investing in building community, people who care about the welfare of one another, connected to an organization. And that can be employees, that can be customers, that can be collaborators. Um, so when we're thinking about building community in that context, uh, we need to understand that all those employees or all those customers are not going to equally participate in any given community effort. Um, which is to say, we can't hold that standard up for any person tasked in helping to knit them together, be that ourselves or delegated. And as a general rule, we see it following a pattern that's well known as the Pareto distribution. For those who don't know, it's also known as the 80-20 rule. And in that uh, Pareto distribution, we see that roughly 20, no more than 20% of resources, which could be members, produces no less than 80% of results, whatever the results are fundraising, um, volunteer hours, whatever it is. And it can very often be what we call an exaggerated parade of distribution. It could be two people out of 100 are doing 90% of the work. And we actually see that in online communities where less than 1% of an online community is doing well over 90% of the work. The reason we need to understand this principle is if we step forward in leadership, we need to recognize that we're probably not going to get to even 50% of intense investment. Now, it might be in a really uh, heavily active group, the worst 10% of participants are still pretty involved, but we're still going to see radically unequal participation. And when we understand that's going to happen, first of all, we get to stop beating ourselves up because most people are not are participating as much as the top 20%. But the second thing is we need to understand for the long-term success of that community we really need to protect that top 20%. And then if we go another uh, parade of distribution, the top 4% needs to be protected because if they leave, if there's a sick person in their family and they move away or um, in a corporate environment, somebody offers them a job and they leave, there is an outsized damage to the functioning of that community and whatever it's doing, which could be social, it could be political, maybe even commercial. And... Part of that is making sure that we in a leadership role are listening to their needs more. And when they have a need, it's responding more quickly than, say, the bottom 80% of participants. Now, that doesn't mean 
that any given community becomes a cult around the top 4% people or that they can't – they're allowed to participate in a way that's not generous, i.e. not committing to the welfare of the whole membership. But we need to understand they are not equal in their value and we need to protect them and serve them more. Otherwise, we lose what we're creating. Wow, that is such a refreshing take on what is a really common problem or perceived as a problem, I think, in our communities here with, you know, two out of a hundred doing 90% of the work. That definitely happens. And it's a cause for frustration. So it's really interesting to hear you say that shouldn't necessarily be something frustrating. That's something quite normal and something that we need. And we, and those people are naturally going to uh, rise to the top, if you like, in communities. And and become those leaders, and we need them, and we have to protect them. I really love that. Mm-hmm. Well, to be clear, it's not that there's a static standard of participation. So if we have 100 members, when I show up not knowing anything about what's going on there, I'm assuming that no less than 80 out of those 100 are not very active, and that of the remaining 20, uh, roughly 16 of them are active, but they're not really charging forward and making the organization grow and serve. And then roughly four people are really doing their intense work. And it might be that it's not top four, it's top six, and it might be it's not top 20, it's top 15, but you get the idea. It's not top 60. So there are a number of ways we can increase participation. And conceptually, we can think about in numbers, for example, um, we can make those bottom 80% participant, we call that the general membership, uh, we can raise that bar. So if you're going to be continue to be a member of our group, whatever that group is, uh, we need to have an agreement from you that the minimum level of participation, be that dollars or hours committed or trips participated in, is higher. And what you're really doing is you're creating an inner ring and you're pushing out people who just aren't committed enough to warrant the investment of the people investing in the community. And it could be that you invite people on the outside so that bottom 80% is better. So one of the things I know that's missing when leadership wants to expand participation is missing invitations. And I know, Amanda, you've been in several groups where you wanted to commit more, you want to participate, and you're just waiting for an invitation. Mm. And uh, even with those invitations, we can anticipate that we're going to see uneven participation after. But we can increase participation by inviting people in and empowering them to demonstrate some kind of leadership in a community. So if someone is really wringing their hands about uneven participation, the first thing to ask is, well, what are we inviting people to do more of? And often it's really, really lousy things like come to an event that you didn't ask to be hosted at a time that's not convenient for you, that kind of thing. Yeah, it was only yesterday I was talking to a client who was asking about how they can, as a committee, more efficiently deal with owners who are making applications to renovate their apartments. So they would, they've just been flooded, as a lot of us have at the moment. People are home, they want to improve their properties, they want to renovate, and there's an approval process to go through, and the committees just feel overwhelmed. And I suggested, why don't you form a subcommittee who might be a renovation subcommittee, and it can include people in the community who have some expertise. Maybe they're retired engineers or architects or contractors or designers, and they're interested in contributing to that that particular item, that particular issue, they don't want to be a committee member and deal with everything, but they have this specific interest in helping with the renovations and reaching out to them and asking them, hey, are you interested? Here's an opportunity. So if I can add on to that, Amanda, what I've noticed is that many people in leadership want to skip over the invitation part Mm. and they make what I call announcements. We need help with the subcommittee for renovations. Is that bad? It's not bad. If anybody is on the fringes of participating or doesn't yet feel welcome to the group, are they going to run over and commit more time and risk themselves with that kind of, air quote here, invitation? No. But if Amanda calls and says, Charles, you're in the community. We understand you have experience with renovations. We have a need for approving plans for neighbors who are wanting to use this time to improve their homes. Will you commit four hours a week to looking over the plans and consulting with your neighbors so they can improve their homes in this time? Wow. Mm. I'm much more likely to jump in with my time. What's the difference? One is an invitation. The other is an announcement. If you never make the invitations, guess what? People don't accept them. And you might get lucky with your announcements. And what I like to point out with when I'm working with executives who want to connect, be it employees or customers or innovators in their field, uh, consider in your entire adult life how many communities you're connected with now that you feel really supported in, that you commit to, that you take risks with, 
that you found through an announcement. And my guess is the number hovers around zero. Indeed. I'm thinking of myself of those communities that I'm a part of where I have had, call it the tap on the shoulder or the personal invitation. And definitely our strata communities are exactly the kind of place where that can happen. These are people you live with. These are your neighbors. You're seeing them every day. You know who they are. You have that personal connection with them. Um, nothing wrong with a tap on the shoulder. Now that takes me, Charles, to the, the welcome. You talk about the art of the welcome, how we can better welcome people into our communities. It's something that we see a lot of our communities here struggle with, new people coming in. They are purchasers, they are brand new owners. Maybe they've never lived in Strata before. They don't really understand the rules that apply, that it's a bit different to living in a, a freestanding property. We have tenants who are coming in on a, a 12 month lease. I see a lot of buildings struggle to connect with these people to have a, a process for connecting with them. You've articulated this in your book, how important the welcome is. Can you share a bit of that with us? Sure. Well, we're welcoming new members and very often there are prospective new members in many communities and that might be yes. true with your listeners as well. Uh, whether they know it or not, they're looking to see that the people they're meeting share at least some of their values, enough of their values and some purpose. And in the case of we've talked about as your listenership, the purpose may be pretty simple, uh, live in peace together, mm. right? Live harmoniously or without conflict, perhaps. But they're looking to find out that there are people there who share their values. And if we don't provide a conversation, an experience that helps them learn that, they're never going to learn it. And they're going to hope for it, or they're going to wonder, do these people share my values? If Amanda, you move next to me and I say, Amanda, so happy you're here. By the way, since you're moving in your boxes now, I want you to know I go to bed at 8 o'clock and that means there can no be music. And by the way, I don't like fireworks because they threaten my house. And by the way, we had a problem with the dog with the last neighbor we had here, so please don't get a dog and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Right? Those might be all totally reasonable requests by a neighbor living five feet away, but that's not a fun relationship because – I haven't demonstrated, oh, and I want to know people like you, and I want to be helpful when you're sick, and I want to look out for your home when you're traveling, and I want us both to have a peaceful place to live as we you know, live our lives. That might include, could you please get the music down after eight? <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. So the, yeah. So the welcome is part of establishing, hey, before the other stuff comes into play, and it will come. Please understand, uh, we do share values, and in this case, we're in the same room talking, purpose together. And that always includes asking questions and listening. Amanda, obviously you're here moving to our neighborhood now. I'm curious what inspired you to move into this neighborhood. Yes. Right? Or in my case, into California or into this home. And then showing you that I understand you. And not in some manipulative way, but like genuinely learning what it is you want to do. And you see that. And we call that the welcome. There needs to be time for that. And I can't believe how many organizations I see schedule approximately zero minutes and they assign approximately zero people to ensure visitors and new members have a welcome. And Amanda, you've been many places, you've been to many conferences, you've been to many organizations. Uh, more is better. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You don't want one person welcoming you to a new conference. Five or 10 or three a day would be fantastic. Yeah. Uh, so we need to recognize welcome is important. It only happens because there's a time to do it and it only happens because someone does it. Yes. And I do see that all the time that there is no space made for the welcome uh, or to meet these new people in our communities. And then, as you say, something goes wrong. The new tenant has put the garbage in the wrong spot, is creating noise, has the dog that they're not supposed to have. And it's the committee saying, how dare they? How dare they? How do, didn't they know? They should know. They should realize, well, if you haven't connected with that person, communicated with them, as we've been talking about, started building that relationship, which is so easy. And I, I do it in my own building. We've got, I've got new neighbors recently, knock on the door, say hello. Then how can you expect them to know and understand what uh, your community is all about? What I love about your example, Amanda, is in order for you to get there, you have to invest the time when there isn't a problem. And the example yeah. of the neighbor with the garbage, I've been that garbage neighbor, and nobody <laughs> explained to me it has to go on the right side. So I took it to the place with the most space. Why is there the most yep. space? Nobody puts garbage there, right? <laughs> and in this case, here's a good example where we do share values and purpose. Um, I want this to be a clean place for my neighbors, thus the garbage is in a bag and set out for pickup. And my purpose is the same. I'm trying to get the garbage out. If you come out to me and your first question is, how dare you put the garbage on the left side? 
even though there actually is a grounding of shared values and purpose, you have just destroyed our relationship that shares that, and now we're fighting. And if you had communicated to me in any way that said, Charles, I'm delighted that we're both trying to make this work, they don't take the garbage unless we put it on the right, that's why there's less room there. Instead of being a bonding relationship where a neighbor is helping me make it work in these circumstances, now we've got a conflict. And believe you me, when the next big thing comes, I'm not going to consider that neighbor a help. I'm going to see them as a threat, and I'll act accordingly, right? Mm -hmm. uh, one of the ways I handle that in my neighborhood is I bake cookies, and I take them around the neighborhood, and I offer them to people. Nice. And quite frankly, I don't care if they eat cookies or not. Um, I hope they do. But if they don't, uh, <laughs> it's not about the cookies. The cookies are a prop for me to approach someone's door for them to see that I'm not there to sell them anything or complain about something. Yeah. I'm offering cookies. And if you say I don't eat sugar, it's like, fine. The prop allowed me for you to see. I just want to connect with you without selling you something. Yeah. And I do it in part so that when something goes wrong, be it for them or for me, our first conversations are not, I have a problem. Yep. with you or you need to help me with something. Now, what would you say, Charles, to viewers who are hearing all of this and saying, Charles and Amanda, sounds great, uh, but you're in fantasy land. That is just not going to happen in our community or we don't have the time for it. I hear that a lot. We don't have the time to connect with everyone who's coming in and out. We're in a 300 apartment building. We have more important things to do. What do you say to those people who I am sure are listening and thinking that? Well, building community, building these relationships are unfortunately or fortunately like everything else in our life. Your results are going to be completely consistent with what you're investing. And if you're going to tell us, Amanda and Charles, that you're investing nothing, then you're going to get results consistent with that. And if that's you're happy with that, God bless you. I don't want to live in your building. I don't want to live near your building. I don't want to talk to people who complain about what's going on in your building because you're not investing it and you're getting those results. If there are 300 people, then... What I'm hearing is that there needs to be some kind of structure, if you really want there to be relatedness, where you can create people in lists, no bigger than seven to ten. We would call them pods in some of the organizations we're working at. And make sure that everybody knows what their pod and have ways to make sure that someone's contacting them at some regularity. In my imagination in a building, um, no less than four times a year sounds right to me. Mm. And that would be the bare minimum. And I'm guessing that one of those times is during the holiday season in December. Mm. Right. So that only leaves three more times. <laughs> yeah. More, more would yeah. be better. And of course, cultures are different, expectations are different, and needs are different. And so there's no magic formula. But we can notice if you're not investing the time, the phone calls, the knocks on the doors, the delivering the cookies, you're going to get results consistent with that. And let's not anybody act surprised. Yeah, and I can you can see the the time suck that happens down the track when you're dealing with all of these problems that have been caused because you haven't made that investment up front. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's talk about shared spaces, Charles. We have so many shared spaces in our strata communities. We call it common property, and it could be anything from the foyer to the lift to the gym, the swimming pool, beautiful rooftop terraces that we're lucky to have in some buildings, backyard areas. It could be a, a community hall or a meeting room. How can we use our shared spaces better? What we can talk about in principle, we're talking about people sharing spaces and building community, is the importance that people need to know they are safe enough. Mm. Maybe not completely safe, but safe enough. And, uh, you know, one thing could mean when I come to work, use that common space. If I don't know that someone's going to ding me for having a screaming two-year-old, right, and I can't control when, if and when my two-year-old screams, I'm not going to feel safe there. How often am I going to come? When I'm there, how friendly am I going to be? On the other side, if someone wants to be in those spaces to do something peaceful and they don't know if there's going to be a loud party there or they're not going to know when there isn't a loud party there, then it's not safe to participate in. Yeah. And so there is a body of work that I can't articulate all here about how we manage expectations and keep a place safe. But this understanding is that we need what in my work we call a host. There is somebody who understands there are general principles of how the space is going to be used. Is it a place for vigorous political debate? Is it a place for people to bring kids? Is it a place for people to sit contemporarily for hours without disturbing? I don't know. And maybe it's all of those things at different times and then they have to be communicated. 
Nonetheless, there's somebody who knows how that space is going to be used, hopefully as a reflection of the community values, and is going to enforce that in whatever ways are appropriate. And if you don't want screaming kids while someone's having a wedding reception there, then enforcement might mean, Charles, uh, from 6 o'clock to 10 o'clock tonight is a wedding reception. It's a no-kid space. Can you come mm. tomorrow at 10? Mm. Easy enough, right? But that there's somebody there. And if this is done well, and all things can be done well and poorly, when we participate as members, we have the security that someone's watching. And they will respond. And as um, Ostrom reported, proportional to the infraction. Um, If one kid is screaming, we don't get banned from the pool for a year. Someone says, you know, Charles, right now this is disturbing. Can you come back in 30 minutes or can we make a kid's time, you know, on Saturday mornings from 11 to 1, something like that. Charles, you talk about vulnerability and sharing vulnerability within our communities, particularly leaders sharing vulnerability and stories of failure. I really love that because I had an experience in my own community where I had come in as a new owner, joining a a new committee, and they'd had some bad experiences. And at the time when I joined, we were also going through something difficult, and I was trying to bring my expertise to the table to help them with that. And they were referring back to, oh, remember five years ago when this horrible thing happened? And it was something quite difficult, but they were laughing about it. And they were sharing that story with me, and it immediately made me feel better about the difficult challenge we were facing then because I thought, okay, these guys have been through something hard before. I think we'll be able to get through this one. Can you talk a little bit to that? It doesn't seem intuitive that we should have our leaders showing vulnerability and sharing stories of failure within a community. Why is that so important, do you think? Right. Well, this is a really deep and important subject, man. I'm glad you brought it up. First, we need to acknowledge that how much and how vulnerability is shared is extremely culturally specific. And and there are different kinds of cultures. There's so-called face-saving cultures, dignity cultures in the American South. And all three cultures relate to vulnerability differently. And the only reason I bring this up is there is no one formula. And we also know that people who have different power status in our cultures, for example, women have a different place than men, how they show vulnerability is read differently. Mm. So I bring it up so that if you're anybody talking about vulnerability, you understand there's no one formula and you're going to have to experiment how and how much by whom in your community. And we can talk about the fact that it is important because vulnerability, and in this case, I uh, refer to Brene Brown's work where amongst her definitions, vulnerability is when we reveal something we're afraid if people knew about us, they would reject us. Mm -hmm. So the fact that this group did something that was Um, not successful, maybe people think they're incompetent and not trust them with anything. Maybe. We need to understand that if we don't share any vulnerability, then all we're showing is a pretension of invulnerability, a pretension of superiority. And it's not true because we don't know anybody who doesn't make mistakes, who hasn't been hurt, who doesn't regret something. It's there. Well, if you look through our lives, of all the people you've wanted to build a trusting relationship with, None of them treated you with a pretension of supremacy and invulnerability. In fact, that was a guaranteed relationship of a conflict with you and distrust. Mm. Right? They're not admitting mistakes. They're not admitting they grow. One of the things we're sharing when we share, this was a hard time for me and I wasn't strong enough for it, or I wasn't wise enough for it, or I was too naive for it, is we're sharing our path toward maturity. Now I know when someone says this, don't let them in. Now I know when someone doesn't deliver, don't ask them to do it the next time and tell them it's okay. I have grown from that experience. And most of us feel more comfortable with people we're trusting when we're learning, A, they're not perfect, they're not pretending they're perfect, and B, they are maturing to be more effective in the role they want to serve. Mm. We extract that from the relationship and what are we left with? Someone who's not growing, someone who hasn't grown, and someone who's pretending there's something they're not. Good luck making that work. Yes, and good luck trusting that person. I love how we've come full circle back to trust and how important that is. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us here today. I know that our communities and their leaders will be able to take a lot of this back and 
action a lot of your principles that you've been talking about. We do have links to your work below this video, including your most recent book, Building Brand Communities, How Organizations Succeed by Creating Belonging. And I do encourage everyone to check out Charles's books. Thank you so much, Charles, out into the world. And please keep doing the good work that you've been doing. It's been a pleasure. I promise. I'm delighted I got to share this time with you, Amanda. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Your Strata Property, the podcast which consistently delivers to property owners reliable and accurate information about their strata property. You can access all the information below this episode via the show notes at www.yourstrataproperty.com.au. You can also ask questions in the comments section, which Amanda will answer in her upcoming episodes. How can Amanda help you today?